Good afternoon, everyone. I welcome you all to the Iman Peace Center. Thank you for sharing your Sunday afternoon with us. It's very nice outside, but it's even better here in this hall, where we'll be delighted to listen to a very insightful presentation from a prolific writer and accomplished scholar and a fine human being who has devoted his life to building bridges between and among the diverse faith communities and who has spent his life in search of truth in scripts and scrolls and scripture. He's here today to help span bridges between our two prominent faith communities in Los Angeles, between Muslims and Christians. Dr. Morrow is a seeker of truth in Islamic history. He is a graduate and former professor of the University of Toronto. Among his numerous written work in Islamic law and Islamic science and Western academic is a great book titled The Covenant of the Prophet Muhammad with Christians of the World. We are eagerly waiting to hear his enlightening and informative presentation from which I'm sure we will all benefit immensely. Needless to say that the presentation will follow by a Q&A and of course a book sign. It is with great pleasure and delight that I introduce to you Dr. John Morrow. I would like to invite Dr. Morrow on the stage. Thank you. In the name of Allah, the most compassionate, the most merciful, praise be to Allah, the Lord of the worlds, and peace and blessings be upon the Prophet Muhammad and his purified progeny. Typically, we say all of that in Arabic, but I'm going to keep everything to English uh, because of all of our guests here today. Um, I deliver a lot of sermons, and I also give a lot of academic lectures. Uh, sometimes my sermons are a combination of the popular and the scholarly. Today it's going to be eminently scholarly. So if in the Hawza Ilmiya you have Muqaddima, Sutu, and Buhuth al Kharij, in other words, you have like bachelor level studies, MA level studies, and doctoral studies, this is going to be more on the doctoral level of things. But nonetheless, even if you get 1% of what I have to share with you today, you will gain more from that than from a hundred different khutbahs. So I begin. The covenant of the Prophet Muhammad with the Christians of Najran is attributed to the Prophet Muhammad. Since Najran, like Medina and many other towns, villages, and cities of the time, was not a single entity but composed of various kusur, or fortresses, homes to different tribes and clans. The Prophet received delegations from many different groups. Some of these may have been stubborn and defiant. Some may have been conciliatory. Some may have submitted, and others may have embraced Islam. When the literature speaks of the Christians of Najran, we are most often speaking about different delegations from Najran which represented distinct parts of the population. One such delegation visited the Prophet in Mecca during the early years of his mission. This could have been as early as eight to ten years prior to the Hijra. However, it seems more likely that it was shortly before or after the first migration to Abyssinia. A document of some sort was produced, but if so, it has not survived. As for the accounts that have reached us regarding a treaty with the Christians of Najran, they took place after the conflict with three Jewish tribes in and around the vicinity of Medina. 
Early Muslim historians suggested that the covenant of the Prophet with the Christians of Najran was composed after the event of Mubahila, or the mutual invocation of curses. However, the oldest sources provide conflicting accounts as to when this event truly took place. Some situate the event within the first few years of the Hijra, while others, such as Akram Zahur, states that it occurred during the final two years. David Samuel Margoliath, the British Orientalist, also opined that the event took place at the end of the Prophet's life. The real significance of the event is also uncertain. For Shiites, it provides proof positive of the spiritual status of Ahl al-Bayt, the Prophet Fatima, Ali, Hassan, and Hussein, peace be upon them all. There are various versions of the covenant of the Prophet Muhammad with the Christians of Najran. They are all very similar in style and content, although they vary considerably in length. So we have short versions, medium versions, and long versions of the covenant or treaty of Najran. Today, scholars have not definitively established whether they are all fragments of a single source document or entirely different treaties granted to distinct tribes that comprised the mosaic of Najran. As Fatal put, puts it, the traditions concerning Najran are confused. They generally relate that in the 10th year of the Hijra, the Prophet sent Khalid ibn al-Walid to the Najranites. However, they do not inform us of the nature and extent of his mission. Ibn Sa'd has him arriving as a conqueror at the head of 400 horsemen and immediately obtaining the conversion to Islam of the tribe of Banu al-Harith. He would have stayed among them to teach them about their new religion and to govern. Ibn Hisham and Masudi have Khalid followed by Ali ibn Abi Talib, peace be upon him, who in only one day succeeded in bringing the entire tribe of Hamdan into Islam. Thereafter, Muhammad would have set up a number of permanent officials in Najran, commissioners for religious instruction, commissioners for the collection of sadaqa, and as Tabari and Mausudi add, commissioners for the collection of jizya. They claim, in fact, that it had been agreed upon that the Najranites who remained Christian, Zoroastrian, or Jewish would not be turned away from the religion, but that each adult, man or woman, free or slave, would pay jizya of one dinar, or its equivalent in clothing. The testimony of Ibn Hisham is still different. According to him, a delegation of Najranite Christians had come to visit the Prophet in Medina, and he invited them to embrace Islam. They refused, but asked that a man be sent to reside in Najran and to act as their arbiter. The Prophet sent them Abu Ubaidah. Yaqubi and Kalfashanti relate that this delegation went to Medina after the Prophet sent the Najranites an ultimatum, giving them the choice between Islam, jizya, or war. According to Abu Ubaid, Baladuri, Ibn Sa'd, and Ibn Athir, the delegation had come to establish the basis of an agreement with Muhammad. For the sake of concision, I will not list the provisions of the treaty, which can be found in the primary sources themselves, in English, in the covenants of the Prophet Muhammad with the Christians of the world, and in French, in Le Statut Légal des Non-Musulmans en Pays d'Islam. I am convinced that we are dealing not with one covenant with Christian tribes from Najran, but with many covenants with the city's various communities over the span of one decade. Consequently, when dealing with the issue of provenance, I will treat all of them as one, for they all claim to originate from the Prophet. Since Muhammad, the Messenger of Allah, peace and blessings be upon him and his progeny, died in 632, this is the latest date that any such document could have been composed. Speaking of the version found in Balavuri, 
Milka Le Le Levi Rubin writes that its special phraseology supports its early date and therefore authenticity. In her opinion, it does look as if the original wording of this long and detailed document has been preserved to a large degree in Baladuri's text. Content-wise, she notes, that the agreement displays clearly that these were sensitive issues raised here and that a meaningful process of negotiations took place. As confirmed by a long list of Muslim and Christian authorities from the early days of Islam to the present, the covenant of the Prophet Muhammad with the Christians of Najran was renewed by Abu Bakr in the year 634. Some sources suggest that Umar rejected the covenant, broke it unilaterally, and expelled the Christians of Najran to Iraq. I have discussed this complex issue in the covenants of the Prophet Muhammad with the Christians of the world, where I present the various possibilities. It is possible that such an expulsion took place later, perhaps during the rule of Umar II, who is sometimes confused in the sources for Umar I, and was falsely attributed to Umar. If Umar did relocate some Christians from Najran, it was a partial measure, as Najranite Christians continued to live in their city of origin until the 13th century. It is highly questionable that Umar rejected the covenant of the Prophet because those who allege that he expelled the Christians all confirm that he urged Muslims to help and protect them. What is more, the second caliph is said to have provided them with compensation, namely, land that was similar to their old property in Najran. He also maintained their status of vimma or protection. According to Waqidi, as cited by Tabari, the only people of the book that Umar expelled from the Arabian Peninsula were Jews who had broken the covenants of the Prophet. The Christians of Najran, Yamama, and Bahrain were explicitly excluded, excluded from the expulsion. According to Baraduri, however, the expulsion order embraced both Jews and Christians. Be that as it may, the record shows a caliph intentionally impartial towards both Christian and Muslim communities. After Waqidi, the covenant of the Prophet Muhammad with the Christians of Najran appears in Ibn Ishaq's Sirat Rasulullah, the earliest surviving biography of the Prophet, where a medium-sized version of the agreement is cited. The historian and Hadith scholar in question died in 761 or maybe 770 of the Common Era. He was only about 150 years removed from the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him. Hence, he had access to the grandchildren of the Prophet and his companions. In the opinion of Samuel Hugh Moffat, a leading scholar on Christianity in the Far East, Ibn Ishaq's lengthy account of the Christian deputation from Najran to Muhammad in Medina was probably based on later memories. If this is the case, namely, that it was passed down through the oral tradition, this may explain why it appears in fragmentary form, or as the copy of the covenant contained in the Chronicle of Sirt is more complete since it was passed down in complete written form. After Ibn Ishaq, the covenant of Najran is found in Muqatil ibn Sulaiman al Balkhi's tafsir or Quranic commentary. It features an addition that relies on Abu Yusuf. The next scholar to provide confirmation of the covenant in question is Abu Yusuf. This historian, who died in 798 CE, cites Abu Bakr's renewal of the covenant of the Prophet Muhammad with the Christians of Najran. Muhammad ibn al-Hasan al-Shaybani cited an elaborate early version of the Najran covenant in his Kitab al-Siyar. Historian Yahya ibn Adam, the author of Kitab al-Kharaj, who died in 818, mentions that he was personally shown 
a copy of the prophetic covenant that was in the hands of the Christians of Najran. Abu Ubaid Ma'amar ibn al-Muthanna, an early Muslim authority, also authenticated the account. Ibn Sa'd also cited the Treaty of Najran in his Tabaqat. The covenant of Najran was also accepted as authentic by Ibn Zanjaway, who included it in his Kitab al amwal The content of the covenant of the Prophet Muhammad with the Christians of Najran soon appeared in the Sunan of Abu Dawood in paraphrased form, which reads, Narrated Abdullah ibn Abbas, the Messenger of Allah, peace and blessings be upon him, concluded peace with the people of Najran on condition that they would pay the Muslims 2,000 suits of garments, half in Safar and the rest in Rajab, and they would lend Muslims 30 coats of mail, 30 horses, 30 camels, and 30 weapons of each type used in battle. Muslims will stand surely for them until they return them in case there is any plot or treachery in the Yemen. No church of theirs will be demolished and no clergyman of theirs will be turned out. There will be no interruption in their religion until they bring something new or take usury. Although they do not mention it, the provisions of the treaty, Bukhari and Muslim did relate the context in which the covenant was provided and the debate that took place between Muhammad and the delegation from Najran. Consequently, they corroborate that the event truly occurred. Shortly thereafter, Habib the monk discovered the original copy of the Prophet's covenant with the Christians of Najran in the House of Wisdom in 878 or 879. This was reportedly the single most important event that took place during the reign of Enosh, patriarch of the Church of the East, between 877 and 884. This complete covenant was included in the Chronicle of Sirt, a historical work that was written in the middle of the 9th century, although some scholars believe that, in its current form, it dates to the 11th or even 13th century. Specific mention of the covenant of Najran is made by Baladuri in his Futu al-Buldan. He cites a letter of Uthman to his Amil in Kufa, which makes a direct reference to the document in question. Greetings, wrote the third caliph. The civil ruler, the bishop, and the nobles of Najran have presented me with the written statement of the prophet and showed me the recommendation of Umar. Ahmad ibn Abu Yaqub ibn Jafar al-Yaqubi, the early Muslim geographer and historian, also related the encounter between Muhammad and the Najranites. Sheikh al-Mufid, the Shiite historian and Hadith scholar, cited a medium-sized version of the treaty in the 11th century. The covenant of Najran is also referenced in Arawd al-Jinan wa Ruh al-Jinan, the famous commentary on the Quran by Abu al-Futu al-Radi. The covenant of Najran was transmitted by Fahra al-Din al-Razi, the Persian philosopher and theologian. Madis, also known in Arabic as Madi ibn Suleiman, who lived in the 12th century, provided the substance of the treaty in Al-Majjal, the Tower, a patriarchal chronicle. Gregorios Abu al-Farij Jamal al-Din, known as Gregory bar Hebraeus, known as Ibn al-Ibri, who lived from 1226 to 1286, also provided its synopsis. The same can be said of Ibn Qayyim al-Jawziyah, Ibn Kathir and Amros, who lived in the 14th century, as well as Qalqashandi, the scribe of the scroll in the Mamluk chancellery in, in Cairo. Bar Hebraeus, the 13th century Syrian Orthodox historian, connected the covenant of the Prophet Muhammad with the Christians of Najan to issue Yahab II. As Maroni explains, according to this account, issue Yahab II concluded a pact with Muhammad, the prophet of the Arabs, through the intervention of Sa'id, the Christian ruler of Najran. 
that protected Christians from attack, promised that the Arabs would not make Christians perform military service or change their manners and laws, that the Arabs would help them repair their old churches, that the tax on the poor would not exceed four zuze, and the tax on merchants and the wealthy would be 10 zuze per man, and that a Christian woman in Arab service would not be forced to give up her faith or to neglect fasting and prayer. Curiously, Gregory Bar Hebraeus, known as Abul Faraj, resided in a monastery that reportedly housed a covenant of the Prophet. As Vital Cuinet writes, close to the city of Mardin exists a monastery by the name of Deir Zafran, where the Syrian bishop resides. It is in that famous monastery that lived the famous Arab historian Abul Faraj. As a Catholicos or bishop, of the Syriac Orthodox Church, he may have had access not to a copy, but to an original Mohammedan covenant. There are some scholars like Joseph Hajar, who do not take the account of Mahdi ibn Suleiman seriously, but who nonetheless believe that it represents a spirit of reconciliation or adulation on the part of Christians towards their Muslim rulers. This could be possible if we were dealing with an isolated text from the 12th century. However, the Syriac translation of the covenant of the Prophet Muhammad with the Christians of Najdan that is contained in the ecclesiastical chronicle of Abu al-Faraj compares favorably to the Arabic version found in Balavuri. Consequently, the document is not something that was concocted in the 13th century to appease or please Muslim rulers. Its main provisions are as follows. The Arabs will protect the Christians from all ill treatment. They will not oblige them to join them in war. They will introduce no changes to their customs and laws. When the Christians wish to rebuild a church that has fallen into ruin, the Arabs will help them with the work. The tribute of the poor, who are not priests or monks, will not surpass four zuzes or dirhams, but that of merchants and the wealthy will be 12 dirhams. When a Christian woman finds herself in the house of an Arab as his wife, he will not incite her to abandon her faith, will not prevent her from completing her fasts, her prayers, and the other duties of her religion. Clearly, this Syriac rendition of the covenant of the Prophet Muhammad with the Christians of Najnan was a synopsis of the longer version. That longer version may have been based on an original copy of the covenant found in 878 or 879, and which was included in the Chronicle of Sirt. Non-Muslim scholars like Adai Sher, Louis Massignon, uh, J.M. Fier, Antoine Fatal, and Jean-Michel Mouton were quick to claim that this purported covenant was the forgery at the source of all the covenants of the prophet that came into circulation. This hypothesis would be plausible if there were no copy of the covenant of the prophet Muhammad with the Christians of Najran that predated the discovery of the alleged original in 878-879. The inconvenient truth, however, is that a document very similar in style and content was cited by Abu Dawood, Abu Ubaid, Yahya ibn Adam, Abu Yusuf, ibn Hisham, and ibn Ishaq, and was renewed by Abu Bakr, who recognized that it was composed by the Messenger of Allah. Peace and blessings be upon him. A detailed description of the covenant of the Prophet Muhammad with the Christians of Najran was provided in Giuseppe Simone Asemani's ninth volume, Biblioteca Orientalis Clementino Vaticana that was published in Rome between 1719 and 1728. The Lebanese Maronite Orientalist, known in Arabic as Yusuf ibn Siman al-Simani, had been sent by the Vatican to Egypt and the Levant in 1717 on a quest for valuable manuscripts. He returned with approximately 150 of the finest ones. The covenant of the Prophet Muhammad with the Christians of Najran was preserved in these aforementioned sources until the present. The short and medium versions of the document, 
have been cited consistently for nearly a millennium and a half. Consequently, their authenticity cannot be called into question. It was only with the publication of the Chronicle of Sirte by Adai Shed in 1919 that the longest, most complete, and most detailed version of the Covenant of the Prophet became known to a small number of Muslim and non-Muslim scholars through the publication of the Arabic text along with a French translation. If Sher's work circulated among some academics, it was only after Muhammad Hamidullah published the full text in Arabic in, 50, in 1956 that it reached broader Arab audience. Although Ayatollah Ahmadi Nianji published it as early as 1959, his magnum opus, Maqatib al-Rasul, did not receive the influence it deserves. Knowledge of the covenant of the Prophet Muhammad with the Christians and Nashan increased after it appeared in Muhammad Amara and Islam al Akhir in 2002. Shaybani's recension of the covenant of Najran was also featured in Adil Salahi's book, Muhammad, Man and Prophet, in 2002. Interest in this lengthy charter of rights and freedoms reached its pinnacle after the publication of the covenants of the Prophet Muhammad with the Christians of the world in 2013. The critical reception of the covenants of the Prophet Muhammad with the Christians of Najran, found in the Chronicle of Sirt, was negative among Western Orientalists. Eugène Tisserand, Lawrence Edward Brown, Louis Massignon, Antoine Fatal, Joseph Hajar, uh, J.M. Fier, Armand Abel, Claude Caen, Secondino Gatta, Raymond Lecoz, Claude Gilio, Vrej Nerses Nersesian, Batieor, David D. Grafton, Philip Wood, Jean Michel Mouton, and Andre Popescu Bellis, Laurent Olivier Mallet, Barbara Rojima, David Wilmhurst, and James Howard Johnson all published studies in which they dismissed the covenant of the Prophet Muhammad with the Christians of Najran, found in the Chronicle of Sirte, as a forgery views that I systematically refute in my study on the Chronicle of Sirt. Muhammad Hamidullah, who was both a Western academic and a Muslim cleric, took a middle ground. He argued that the Treaty of Najran, found in Muslim sources, was authentic. While the Covenant of Najran, found in the Chronicle of Sirt, had been interpolated or expanded upon. Alejandro Garcia San Juan has erred on the side of caution and assumed a neutral position. Samuel Hugh Moffat won one step further and accepted the possibility that it was based on a real agreement between the Prophet and the Christians of Najran. Other Muslim scholars, including Muhammad Amara, Harun Yahya, Adil Salahi, Milkai Levi Rubin, Myself, Yassin T. Jiburi, and Ahmed El Wakil have presented evidence in favor of its authenticity. In fact, in 2014, Yassin Jiburi published a piece titled Prophet's Covenant to the Christians of Najran. In this brief article, in which he provides a new English translation of the document, based apparently on the version found in Ayatollah Ali Ahmadi Miyanji's Maqatib al-Rasul, or the one contained in Muhammad Hamidullah's Wathaiq. In the words of Jibouti, This text is very important in light of the fierce attack on Islam by some ignorant or misled fanatical Christians and Jews. It reflects Islam's tolerance in the most glorious way, so it deserves your attention and dissemination. Following the agreement reached at the end of the Mubahala, the Prophet decided to write a covenant to regulate the relationship between the Muslims and the Christians so it would remain valid for all time to come. 
This covenant is very important because it reflects Islam's respect for other religions.